Good evening, everybody. Well, evening here anyway, in the Temple of Silence here in southern Finland. Last week, we moved from the Little Bear Meditation Center way up north, you know, almost 70 degrees in the north with Polaris, uh, uh, the, the first, or depending how you want to look at it, the last star in the Little Bear just about overhead, not entirely. You'd have to be at the North Pole, but uh, very much as you look up, there are the northern lights, and uh, on a good night, uh, there is uh, Polaris. So um, one of those stars of direction, you know, along with uh, Dube, which is Leo, and uh, Merak, which is Aries. Those are the two pointers, and then it's hard not to imagine Polaris as having a uh, very strong connection with the other fire signs, Sagittarius, pointing the way for all of us. And indeed, in these uh, troubled times, as those who are attempting to be real disciples, we have to uh, hew to our chosen path and not be deflected for any length of time, you know. You can get off the rails, but you have to get right back on and uh, keep moving towards that goal which is envisioned. And that goal is certainly, you know, the emergence of the soul ray of our planet, the second ray soul, through the um, assistance of that very powerful dual event, uh, the externalization of the spiritual hierarchy and the reappearance of the head of the hierarchy who is the Christ. Those are the, well, I think those are the three most happening things on our planet at this time. And uh, whatever we do, hopefully um, it is somehow uh, dedicated to that goal and subservient basically to that goal. There can be a lot of variety in what we do, but there's got to be a way of tying uh, our actions in with those major <clears throat> planetary events. So this is uh, the Dissipation of Glamour webinar, uh, number 52, I guess, this time. We're inching along, you know, and um, we will somehow uh, keep going as long as we can. We can't expect <laughs> that glamour will be dissipated uh, in a very global sense any time soon, but I think great clarifications are coming. And the whole initiation of humanity, <clears throat> or at least a good portion of it, uh, to leaven the mass uh, will occur when the Christ um, returns uh, to visible um, objectivity uh, in the eyes of most. Every eye will see him, we are told, but of course, the question is, will they recognize uh, who he is? So when the Christ does reappear, it will be the indication that the first initiation of uh, the requisite portion of humanity has occurred. And toward that, we are all working in our individual ways and in our group ways, of course, even more important. So good to see you all here. And uh, Lots of familiar names. Um, very happy that you're able to, you know, join this effort in a consistent manner. Let's just have a little alignment first. You know, this is our, our map number eight here. You know, this is, uh, you'll see that it's an AUM chart. It's uh, Keith Bailey has uh, created the colors and, you know, kind of the, uh, the, the layout is the Tibetans, but the the ray colors, you know, and so forth uh, were filled in by Keith, and it's an uh, advantage to all of us to see how these things work. So let's um, think of ourselves as those who are becoming soul-infused uh, personalities. You know, that really doesn't, is not the fullest measure until the fourth initiation, but we're on our way. 
<clears throat> we are subjective beings and we are behind the obvious form. We are behind certainly the obvious physical form and behind and within the etheric and behind and within the astral and behind within the lower mental. We could actually keep going with that, but for the present moment, our subjectivity takes us into the realm of the soul with its spiritual light, love, and will. So wherever we are, apparently, in that illusion we call time and space, um, we are all really drawn together at a point of tension, which is described as a focused, immovable will. And if our point of tension is sufficient, we can achieve, he tells us, in a few hours what might otherwise take years. So let's all individually study and attain the requisite point of tension and in our groups, uh, even more important for those breakthroughs that we all aspire towards. So we're offering ourselves to the spiritual hierarchy of our planet, which is in a way, the, in a certain way, the soul of humanity. We're offering ourselves as instruments to help uh, get rid of uh, these distortions and uh, veils which prevent us from seeing the truth. And if we want to be effective in the world, we have to be effective in our own nature from the perspective of esoteric psychology. So we'll just keep going with our service work uh, as little interrupted as possible. Sometimes Tui and I are traveling. There's nothing we can do about that. And although I'm sure I long to give a glamour webinar above a seven, you know, on a 747 over the Atlantic Ocean, but uh, for the time being, uh, we'll do the best we can to be as consistent as possible. So we're ready to think, ready to work. We're, we're working on the glamour of fear. There are all kinds of fears. It's the great dweller on the threshold as far as our humanity is concerned. Permeates uh, the various kingdoms. Uh, we find it in the animals, of course. The lord of the human kingdom and the animal kingdom are very closely related and uh, for a long time not too harmoniously related. We find some kind of reaction of recoil in the plant kingdom and who knows if we investigated the mineral kingdom sufficiently we might find the lower um, corollary or analogy to the withdrawing reaction fear. We'll just sound an ohm uh, committing ourselves to our process. Oh. Oh, pretty close, pretty close to that G. I don't have perfect pitch. I have a friend in the work who has it. It's a good thing to have. Now, we're on fear. We've discussed uh, fear in general. Last uh, time we worked on the uh, fear of death, a major, major fear which has its roots in um, an existential consideration 
the ultimate fear of non-being, the ultimate fear of annihilation, and of course, that is due to ignorance. Somehow we got cut off in later Atlantean days, early Aryan days, and uh, our ability to know for certain that we were not the body, uh, and as far as that goes, even the lower personality uh, was sacrificed uh, through our own misdeeds and our own inattention to the truth and also the attacks of the counterforce, which would like very much to see our consciousness split into many pieces that do not communicate with each other. So anyway, we are um, regaining now that which was lost. And during the Aquarian age, uh, which is uh, an age of deep perception, after paying the price, you know, we'll have to pay the price in Saturn for 720 years, about, starting in the year uh, 2017, roughly, or exactly. Then we'll have a, a huge... Uh, expansion of consciousness under Mercury, and later a huge expansion of brotherly love under Venus. So we'll accomplish much during this age, and uh, given the great advantage that we have with the trans Himalayan teaching, we had better uh, be in the forefront of the effort, uh, which so many people uh, need to be guided by. So. We're working for our next incarnations here and uh, doing what we can in this one. So here, you know, uh, aspirants, what's an aspirant? You know, even the Christ is an aspirant. Even our planetary logos is an any Any being short of the uh, universal logos, whatever that is, you know, that huge all-embracing being probably has uh, galaxies for minor chakras. Uh, <laughs> Any, anything short of that is an aspirant, <laughs> aspires towards a universal logoic hood or something like that. And who knows about the universal logos, which we essentially are. It, it aspires to be uh, withdrawn into absolute infinity with the disappearance of every universe. Some of you may be interested in these more uh, metaphysical thoughts, uh, and then you may, if you are, wish to join our uh, identification as being a group, uh, which uh, deals with uh, matters that stimulate the abstract mind into uh, appreciation of uh, considerations which normally are not considered at least in our circles. So just let Brett or me know, or both of us, and we'll be happy to send you an application to identification as being, which is uh, really uh, from the time of the second initiation onward, around that time, and so many of DK's uh, students are around that period, the whole issue of identification and of the will, and of uh, approach to the understanding of Sanat Kumara. Those things are germane. So we can, with responsibility, approach this understanding uh, of identification, participation in identification. And when Master DK told us that he was an initiate into, what did he call it, this? the uh, state of being, the curriculum of being, something initiate into the program of being, being. He said he was really telling us something. So that's going to be a master who dwells, as we will one day dwell, in the state of true isolated unity, which can only be uh, reasonably appreciated by one who is a master, though we can begin to look towards it, whatever ray we're on. Okay, the fear of the future. This is one of those uh, fears to which the aspirant is prone. Uh, 
I think it's fear of the future and fear of failure. Uh, maybe someone correct me if I'm incorrect. I know fear of failure is right in there as a major fear of all aspirants. We have to consider ourselves as aspirants and disciples too. You can be both really. So fear of failure and fear of the future, these are found very much in the uh, ranks of those who aspire to the higher, wider soul state. So what does he say here? He says, this is a fear that will as yet show a growing tendency to develop. I guess the more aspirants there are, the more the tendency and will cause much distress in the world before it is obliterated. He seems to promise that it will be obliterated. And of course, you know, it's our ignorance of the glory that lies ahead and the way to that glory, which makes us fear what will unfold in the future. I wonder if any of us have uh, faced our worst fears and tried to imagine them, you know, uh, death, starvation, annihilation, suffering, pain, you know, just look at it, look at it. Why do we fear these things when essentially we will be relieved of any possibility of these things in an ongoing way? Of course, it's the perverse nature of the human mind, which seems to cook up the idea that you can suffer in hell forever. What about the forever that preceded your uh, appearance in the first place? But anyway, it's a um, sad, sad reversal and distortion that we fear that we will have ongoing suffering instead of the far more likely possibility that the suffering and uh, Ignorance and all that is what Master Moria calls a, a hideous comma, just a comma, <laughs> and then on to the reality. So anyway, uh, this fear of the future, and we all have to question whether we have it, whether from the health point of view or the relationship point of view or the financial point of view, you know, just go around the horoscope, you can find a fear in every house of the horoscope, if you look hard enough, and uh, probably not all of that has been overcome. Even first-rate types who are relatively fearless, you know, have some interesting fears which the others don't have. So it grows out of three human capacities, this fear of the future, instinctive psychological thought habits. They come from the past, right? Anything instinctive really is built into the animal nature and personal nature, which have their roots deep in the animal nature, which we, you know, through which we have manifested, and hark back to the primal instinct of self-preservation. After all, uh, if what you see is what you get, if what you see is the only thing you know that you identify with, you don't want it to disappear, because there's that great existential fear of annihilation, especially once you have self-consciousness. So uh, we're, we're born with this instinct to keep the form intact, and our thought habits have grown out of these uh, primitive self-preservative uh, instincts. Interesting, though, he says that savage races, not too politically correct, okay, but, you know, he, he says it as he sees it. Even the word sauvage, you know, I mean, savage, so, I mean, the, <laughs> behind it all is the idea of some kind of wisdom. So savage races have little of this. That forward-looking, anticipatory state of mind is predominantly a human characteristic, something that grows with our self-consciousness and our humanity. And is that germ of the imaginative faculty, how are we going to use our imagination, linked to the mental processes? Because now we can reason and see 
what may indeed happen, which will eventually merge, and this is the positive part, out of what it has been, will eventually merge into that intuitive meditation, once the Antikorana is built, once the Buddhic plane is really contacted, and even the the soul, which carries its own measure of um, intuition, will eventually merge into that intuitive meditation plus visualization, which is the basis of all creative work. In building the Antikorana, we have to link up the Buddhic plane with the way the imaginative processes, processes of the astral plane uh, create. And so there's the unguided imagination uh, filled with terror and recoil and uh, all kinds of uh, unpleasant prospects. And then there's imagination guided by intuition, guided by pure reason. And that's what we're supposed to at least imagine as we're building the Antikorana. So we do look forward, man tends to look forward and backwards, more so than living in the primitive now. There's also living in the eternal now, that comes later, but living in the primitive now, which is the state of the uh, early uh, races, some, some examples of which we still have, you know, individualized people, but who don't have the solar angel yet, they will in the next round. Okay, so it leads to intuitive meditation eventually, that anticipation and visualization and true creative work, which means that the creativity of our imagination serves the divine plan. But we're not there yet, right? At present, it is a menace and a hindrance. You know, the, the terrors that we may have based upon the ancient rendings, you know, the violent deaths, the imprisonments, the torture. I mean, you just name it, we've been through it. And for some of us who are more sensitive, not necessarily including myself here, but for some of us who are more sensitive, they show themselves in the present moment and they overlay the realities of the situation and give us very unpleasant anticipations based upon a misunderstood or not understood past and the temporary nature of that past. Ancient suffering, you know, he speaks as one who knows, right? Ancient suffering, dire memories, haunting miseries, aren't those potent words? Deep-seated in the subconscious, which he said can rise to the surface like a boiling cauldron if we're not careful. Deep-seated in the subconscious, rise to the surface frequently and cause a condition of fear and of distress, which no amount of reasoning uh, seems able to quiet. So we might say that um, the mind alone is not sufficient to quiet the rising fears arising from the sub ah, subconscious. Okay, facilities of communication put even the most unimportant, meaning, you know, people who really don't have a whole lot of development yet, but they have the pretty wide open solar plexus, uh, facilities of communication more and more. This is a globalized world and we see all the misfortune happening anywhere. Facilities of communication, whether they're external or you know, psychic and internal, put even the most unimportant on rapport with the tragedies, pains, and sufferings of his brother thousands of miles away. You know, you've, you've seen how the people are forced to live. You've seen the, the slum conditions. You've seen people that are uh, leaving their country. Uh, for fear and uh, are involved in migrations that take years and in camps that none of us would like to live in, you know, deprived of almost everything we think is important to sustain the quality of our life. And we identify with that. 
if we are at all sensitive and we're becoming more sensitive all the time. So, you know, you sometimes you say, well, you know, there but for you go I, and there but for the grace of God go I, and you put yourself in that situation, there you are in that horrible, dirty tent with, you're lucky if you have a tent with all kinds of uh, dirty water and diseased conditions, and you have your children, uh, your loved ones, and you're expected to live in that, you know, you identify. And it's a horrible thing. And the more sensitive, the more horrible one realizes it is. So we need a decent uh, standard of living for everybody on this planet. Decent health conditions, education conditions, you know, any one of us could get started on what we need and what we don't have. But when we tune in on what other people don't have and what we have, well, the, the fear condition arises. We could be there. Maybe attacks from other countries in the future, maybe a general war condition will put us there. We're sensitive and we feel the distress. So, right. The economic catastrophe of the present time, it hasn't gone away, has it? Has brought about a condition of mass terror. Well, you know, if you can't support yourself, you sicken and you die and you're deprived of everything. And the more sensitive the individual, the more he will react to this state of mind. Fear of the future is therefore a distressing blend of instinctual memory, because we've all been, you know, torn apart by the wild animals and what else? We've all had many violent deaths, which don't last too long. What does he say? That sense of overwhelming dread and then uh, an electric shock and that's it. <laughs> but, you know, when you look forward to it, it looks a lot worse. So it's a distressing blend of inst instinctual memory and anticipatory imagination, not guided by the intuition. And few there are who escape this menace. So we can ask, you know, maybe we stifle these things in our thought process. Maybe we are truly fearless. Maybe we're beyond all this. Maybe and maybe not. Worry and anxiety are the lot of every man, he says, and cannot and will not be offset and overcome by any lesser factor than the soul itself. So you can see how important it is what we're doing to give ourselves the tools to give other ready human beings the tools to overcome these great distressing debilitating states of sentiency and of kama manas which make life so divided so distressful but you know the secret is in our teaching and the more we truly live as the soul and even more, the more we have trust in the immortal God within, the more we realize ourselves as that immortal God, the more we realize our beginninglessness and our endlessness, to put it in metaphysical terms, then the less we fear those encounters which will minimize the form or deprive us of the form with which we are temporarily identified. Fear of the future. Well, we're, we're told about death, the great adventure, right? And uh, the glory that lies ahead in the higher worlds. Master Moria said an interesting thing. He said, look at the average human being in the form the minute he drops the form he suddenly has renewed vigor and is fearless well at least you know it's much more minimized in his life you know full of strength the minute the limitations of the brain and the form are dropped and suddenly renewed vigor and positivity is uh, entering into the life of the one who has passed beyond that limitation we call the uh, physical etheric form. So what does the future really hold 
It holds for some the heaven worlds, the Devachan of the fourth subplane of the mental plane, or maybe the some of the summer lands of the higher astral plane. It holds a much, much wider life, and it holds an interlude of the return to the causal body and realizing oneself as one really is before, uh, not all return, but many do, and then a descent back into limitation. But really, it widens out greatly. And this is what we fear. So, you know, later, as the Tibetan says about death, that we recognize it as a very familiar experience. Okay, and it's one of our greatest fears. And the future may lead to death or unpleasantness or unhappiness or to loss of all that. But but isn't compensation a fact? Is not everything restored to us? And in truth, is it not so <clears throat> that ultimately there is never any loss? Uh, I mean, really, never. You know, how, how can we, if you strip away all the veils of what we are, even strip away the out the the um, the focus of the monad. Strip it all away. It turns out that we are pure being itself, never born, never coming to an end, containing all, absolutely infinite. You know, uh, veil after veil drops away, and our life expands <clears throat> until it becomes real life. Well, for many of us, this is a theory. And maybe once we go through those processes again, we'll say, hey, it's not a theory. I remember this. This is a fact. So somehow, right here and now, we have to bring through all that we deeply realize, even though uh, the limitations of our brain consciousness resist it. Well, OK, um, you know, th these are so important from a treatise on white magic these different kinds of fears, and then the remedy of it, the me meditative remedies for these fears. Um, we'll be discussing those too. He considered it such an important book, and he said it was a, a treatise, was it something like treatise on the management or the control of the astral body? And although so many of us, you know, are well-read in the teaching and, you know, maybe have had a college education or the equivalent or beyond or whatever, the astral body is very potent on this planet. And its mixture with Manus, making Kama Manus, is a great obstacle to true realization of truth. So we may be more susceptible than we know and have many more things that we have to work through than we really know. But if we persist, and we must, because we've been doing it forever, <laughs> um, we will win. We will succeed. I always look at everybody and everything and say, ah, whatever I see is the graduate, the successful graduate of infinitudinous universes. After all, the great breath has been breathing forever. <laughs> So uh, at least if Blavatsky is to be credited and it, it makes sense. So somehow we will realize in the eternal now, our eternally infinite, beginningless, endless nature. That's our goal. And when we become initiates into the science of being through identification and what I call infuception, then these things that are just concepts to us will become our everyday reality. All right, so, you know, maybe that's enough. I don't want to, I don't want to go too far because there's a lot to discuss here about the future. So this is the end, uh, end of uh, uh, Dissipation of Glamour webinar number 52 readings. Uh, and today is the 20th uh, of October, and we'll work next uh, Friday on readings uh, for number 53. Um, 
and that'll be on the 27. I think 27. Let me just check over here. Should be able to add that up, huh? Yeah, 27th of October. And we'll continue with the fear of physical pain. And uh, this whole section of white magic is absolutely essential. If we ourselves are not to be subject because of fear to the glamour of fear. You know, fears are hidden often. And only certain circumstances and states of mind bring them out so we can be quite assured, you know, that we don't have it, but we do. And the great disciple, you know, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, his uh, great saying, one of them, and probably taken from a much earlier uh, enunciation of the same idea, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. So we have to eliminate this and become fearless disciples. <laughs> Let you know when I get there. Fearless disciples who somehow, uh, when the Black Lodge looks on at them, are a cause of worry. <laughs> Morio said it's a very bad sign. The Black Lodge is, uh, is, considers it a very bad sign when they uh, encounter a truly fearless uh, individual. And I think we can see why, you know, that great astral energy, that place on the uh, astral plane that they call uh, Mara Kara, the place of Mara, the enemy of the Buddha, you know. Well, if you're not afraid, you can deal with that. And I've told you the story, and you know, uh, that story about uh, Madame Rorick, first-rate disciple, sometimes called Urusvati. And, uh, you know, she marched right into a meeting of the uh, Black Lodge uh, on the astral plane, assured them of their defeat, and walked out untouched. Uh, you kind of, when you think about the possibility of terrors, that might confront you, there's hardly a greater terror than that. And she had such tremendous courage and fearlessness. Okay, so an example is set. All right, friends, so so let's, uh, the next time we'll deal with the fear of physical pain and maybe we'll get on to the fear of failure, all that, that's such a such a big one. Even if we just do one paragraph at a time, it stimulates our thought, it makes us think of our own life, and perhaps um, will be the cause of revelation, which is what we're doing here. Uh, that's the reason we're together, and to uh, help to clear the air, so to speak, or clear the water, clean the water of the astral plane. So now, if any of you... Uh, wish to say something, write something, ask something, whatever, um, you're most welcome to do that before we get into our um, meditation on the dissipation of the glamour of fear. And, you know, particularly here we've been dealing with uh, this fear of the future, fear of the future. Okay. So, Ivan, uh, go, yes, go ahead. Okay. Michael, you mentioned uh, there's a group of people that are individualized but don't have solar angels. Can you uh, talk some more about that? Maybe 10%. Or, I don't know. Maybe I should be careful when I enunciate percentages, but uh, she said that those of us who have solar angels, HPB said this, are like hothouse plants. You know, we're being... Uh, intensely cultivated, probably because of some retardation in the past, but she listed certain groups uh, for whom the solar angel provided stimulation of the mental unit sufficiently to cause individualization, but not a presence within the mind and brain. So the, the, the kind of solar angelic supervision which we have, these groups, she 
she mentioned the um uh I, you know not not all because you know many times advanced souls uh, incarnate in these groups, but she mentioned the the Aborigines of Australia. She mentioned the uh, uh, Ainus of uh, Japan or islands around there. She mentioned some of the Bushmen, uh, maybe in Africa. Uh, their their day of opportunity comes particularly in the next round. They are progressing, of course, but they don't have that intensive cultivation by the presence of the solar angel within their system. They have a causal body, of course, but it's uh, maybe in the old way the causal body was formed and not by the uh, intervention of the solar angel. There's a couple of different ways uh, that individualization occurs. And apparently on the moon chain, individualization was not through the solar angel, but through the striving of animal man towards his higher powers and a, um, a, a, a egoic lotus was created but not uh, sustained by the presence of the solar angel so there are some uh, groups on our planet and probably a lot of them came with the latest wave of individualization which occurred in atlantis on this particular chain not moon chain of course and probably not even those individualized in lemuria but probably more those individualized in early Atlantean days. And uh, interestingly enough, a vast majority of the first ray monads, of which there are not so many, but okay, came in in Atlantean days and not in Lemurian days. He gives the percentages for all that. So there are groups that are relatively early man. They don't have much of the egoic lotus developed, but everybody has some activity, at least in the first petal or, or unfoldment in the first petal of the egoic lotus, which is the most primitive petal. And these groups are on their way. They have a whole lot less time invested than so many of us who came from the moon chain or even the earlier solar system. Uh, so that that's my take on it. Blavatsky talks about that, and she lists some of the groups, and the Tibetan uh, does too. Best okay. I can Thank you, you bet, you bet, okay. Yvonne, you bet. I mean, you know, and, and then, of course, what do these groups need? You know, uh, the needs of different groups who have different aspects of the uh, egoic lotus developed in different petals, they all have different needs. And the astrology and rays, as they impinge into their lives, produce different kinds of developments depending upon the stage in which they find themselves. So these people are in a very instinctual phase and if they're moving into the second pedal uh, art and creativity of some kind are possible we see some amazing stuff coming out of the uh, australian ab aboriginal art and they have a very close relation to the uh, uh, astral plane but they're going to be abstracted uh, and even their lore tells us that they will be abstracted they expect to be abstracted they've done their job they say and they will be uh, find their day of opportunity coming in the fifth round, which is what at least what Master DK says. There's been fascinating stuff, and you know the Manu has to look over all of these different racial types and groups and the degree of their unfoldment, and try to provide what is needed by each one of these groups. Okay, Ivan, thank you. Now let's see. Are there others who would like to ask or write something or, you know, we've been dealing with the fear of the future. Just examine your own life. <laughs> Maybe your attitude towards the future is very positive, as it should be if we know that we are the immortal monad, uh, you know, or semi-immortal soul. But maybe there are anticipations. We live in, you know, when you know a hurricane's coming, you're liable to feel some anxiety about it. And we have leaders in the world today who are ignorant. And, you know, they don't, they're not connected with hierarchy. They don't know what's best. And there, there's reason to have at least an anticipation that things may get tough. And DK tells us, that in the first 720 years of the Aquarian age, 
which will be lived out under Saturn, it will be a period of difficulty. Well, maybe that's already beginning. You know, we're going to learn the law of group relations. I think that's how it's going to go. And there's going to be a lot of uh, sharing required. And a lot of people don't want to do that, you know. So we'll we'll share the good, we'll share the evil. Uh, that's coming. Okay. Other... Uh, other questions about the future? Other thoughts? Okay, let's see. What do we got here? And Michael. Many of these fears seem to be based on a fear of change, particularly one when one is controlled by others. Yeah, I suppose, you know, one of the worst things that can ever happen is that tiny portion of the divine will, which in a way each one of us is, that that tiny portion would be stifled and not allowed to really express. Now, that's the great disadvantage of totalitarianism and dictatorship. One way is imposed upon all, rather than in the tremendous variety uh, which is engineered by the divine will. Rather than that, we have monotony and uniformity. Master Moria tells us how monotonous really, the Black Lodge and its representatives are. And there are these sometimes these um, discussion of what's called the banality of evil. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm listening to a lot of the Nazi music, you know, and it was thump, thump on the band, you know. It, it wasn't very inspiring. I, I, I know that when Stalingrad was falling, they were listening to Beethoven's Ninth, but it didn't help. Uh, and, you know, when the big rallies came together, you just had the brass band playing banal music when horrible evil was uh, rampant at the time. So anyway, yeah, um, uh, Heraclitus told us that the only thing we have is constant change, but the one stability in all of that is the sameness of being, the ultimateness of our being nature not anything in consciousness, not anything in terms of intelligence, but the sameness of essence. And that's something that is the true stability of life. So when we reach that, we can, um, we can give up this fear of change because all there is is change forever and no change forever. And we have to somehow, as Master Mori would say, we have to contain the paradox. Okay, Michael. Best I can do on that one, and yeah, thanks. It's an important point. Okay, let's see. Uh, ba -ba. Anybody else that would like to offer a thought? You know, just just ponder for a moment. You know. Okay, we all have a few years to live, maybe or whatever, or longer. How do you, you know, what's your attitude? Is it an attitude that victory will be yours? That no matter what comes your way, you as an immortal being will prevail? Or is there some fear and trembling, you know, in the words of the theologian, was it Kierkegaard? Is there some fear and trembling in anticipation of what might happen. Do you think that you can be touched? Or are you, in a way, the higher correspondence to the caste called the untouchables? I think the very highest caste should be called the untouchables because they know the immortality of their essential nature. Are we living in that? Or do the everyday circumstances, the health, relationship, finance, all that, do they have us down? Are we, is our spirit made lower somehow when we anticipate those factors of life in every house of the horoscope? So we have to search that out. 
We have to search that out and do our best, cast out all fear, all hate, all greed. You know, here, I'm going to turn to page um, Treatise on White Magic here, page 473 and 4. And he gives us the great advice, you know. Here it is. The 15 councils. Um, here it is. For thee, the aspirant on the way of life, the way of conscious building is not yet the goal. The work of cleaning out the atmosphere of thought. I'll get it. Of barring fast the doors of thought to hate and pain, to fear and jealousy and low desire, must first precede the work, conscious work of building. See to thy aura, O traveler on the way. Hmm. Okay, so he really uh, he really is direct there. There's more along this line. Look, watch close the gates of thought. Sentinel desire. Be as a sentinel, sentinel to your desires. Cast out all fear, all hate, all greed. Look out and up. And then he talks about speech. Avoid the selfish words. Avoid the word of hate. Um, avoid the idle words. They all have their effect, and they wander back to those who sent them forth, and they wreak havoc on the sender. So do turn to page 473 and 474 and 5 in a treatise on white magic and see these magnificent uh, 15 councils that guide us aright and will, uh, he tells us, if we obey, make a master of us. That's what will happen. Uh, you know, I've memorized these. I don't know if they're a state of memorization right now. It's been a while, but, you know, memorize them. Hold them in your nature. Repeat them. Live by them. Good advice, you know. Tough to carry out, but okay. He is clear about what we must do. Okay, other, other thoughts? I hope I'm giving you enough to chew on here, where Master DK is, really. Yes. Yes? <laughs> okay. Catherine okay. has a written comment. I got it. Could you expand on statement four, the dual purpose of the mind? Well, actually, uh, maybe I can. Um, discover thou hast them. Okay. The mind... Um, is receptive of higher inspiration. Actually, you know, look, Catherine, when he discusses the, um, he discusses Scorpio and the dual function of Mercury in Scorpio. You know how powerful Mercury is in Scorpio. It's, it's the hierarchical ruler. It looks above to the buddhic plane of intuition where it rules. Scorpio and Mercury rule the buddhic plane where the divine plan is somehow articulated through pure reason and with relative wholeness to our time on our planet. So receive that. Let Mercury look above. It's got that moon on top of its head, you know. <laughs> it receives. At the same time, it is a creative, disciplining agent. Well, first of all, it conducts the will. It's almost like a triple use. It says, you mind me. Now, this is the will coming through the mind. Do this. Okay. Then it receives. That's the second ray aspect. Then it has the intelligence aspect to it. It creates. The third ray is called, the Tibetan gives his... Um, uh, preferred name for the third ray, the ray of creative intelligence. So create below. Discipline yourself, ray one. Receive the nature of the plan, uh, ray two, and then create 
in the lower worlds, the lower 18 subplanes, the um, creations which align with the plan. So it's the disciplining work, the receptive work, and the creative work. These are how I look at it. Uh, the, dual, the dual use is basically above and below, as far as I see it. But uh, many of us who are trapped in the concrete mind, we're just used to thinking down here without real receptivity, nor do we have the power of the will coming through the mind as a directing agent. So uh, we have to become more than, we have to become creators in the light. I see the greatest light. Okay, Ray too. So let's get that light from the higher world, first from the soul, then from the triad, then from the monad. And incidentally, the will will come through along with that saying, do this, stick to this, stick to the creative use of the mind in alliance with the plan and as much of the purpose as we can. So basically the answer to this thing is above and below. And the mind is capable of functioning in both ways. Now, as disciples in training, I don't know what we were like before, but we're learning how to receive through spiritual telepathy the things that pertain to the soul and triad, maybe the monad. That's a higher use, and we have to train ourselves to do that. Uh, so act out the archetype below through creative intelligence, also of the mind. So I hope that gives uh, an idea of how two functions or even three functions can apply to our mental world. And of course, the mind in a way is divided into three parts. Three minds unite, abstract mind, higher mind, and concrete mind. Subplane one, abstract mind, higher mind, subplanes two and three, and concrete mind four, five, six, and seven. And, you know, there's other ways to look at that three mind, minds unite thing as well. And uh, I won't get into that right now, but it goes all the way up to the atmic plane, which is a mental plane of will. So let's be flexible. And one day our mental body will be one complete thing and we will seamlessly go from one thing to another without those changes of register. I've used this example before, but when you're a singer, a lot of people, they have register changes. So their chest voice sounds different from the middle voice, sounds different from the higher voice. Eventually they're able to blend it all together. So you have one unified field of mind and one unified presentation of the voice. Okay, Catherine. That's what I could say on that. Other thoughts or questions? <clears throat> okay, well, I just want to express my appreciation for the fact that you are here. <coughs> Excuse me, we are learning together. And um, uh, when Olivia, Tuya, and I uh, kind of got together on this process, uh, we just wanted to offer the possibility of going deeper into the whole question of glamour and everything surrounding it so we could at least begin to free ourselves from a very subtle inhibitory factor, these veils which prevent us from seeing the truth or distort the truth. They are reflected on the etheric plane as well, uh, in the etheric, uh, what do you call them, uh, veils, uh, the veil of impulsion, uh, the veil of distortion, uh, the veil of separation, and the veil of aspiration. All those things have to be understood and worked through without over-discrimination, says the Tibetan. Basically, we have a lot of work to do on the etheric physical plane. That's going to be maybe the first thing. It's somehow going to correspond, I think, with the discovery of Vulcan, which has so much uh, physical etheric uh, relationship and also just plain material relationship. And then uh, Vulcan will be applied as well with its very great light uh, and its spiritual will to the conquest of glamour along with Venus, very important, Mercury, very important. Those particular faculties, glamour will come next. But we're getting a head start. 
uh, and a very, very great problem. And so let's, even though we don't know everything about it, we'll just persist until we know more. Okay, then if there is nothing immediately else, then let's get into our meditation. And meanwhile, you know, uh, we'll try to think about fear without having it expand in our lives. Sometimes where you put your attention is what happens. But uh, DK gives us three very powerful methods for overcoming fear. And we're going to study those and root out those fears. Pluto will do its work before initiation. It's so active before all these initiations. and it dredges up a lot of stuff that we didn't even know existed, and then we can deal with it. You can't deal with your unconscious while it's still unconscious. So uh, Pluto will help us there, and we will manage to clear our aura. Okay, friends, so here we go. Right. We'll take now coming together, realizing we are a group instrument for this work. We'll take some moments of silence to make our integration even stronger. And this period of silence really is increasing our point of group tension. Probably we can feel that happening. Now we will use the protection of the protective formula, making the cross of divinity as he uh, describes it. And we do need this. So let's not think that we can waltz into this unconquered area without individual and group protection. So we'll create this very radiant cross involving the eyes, forehead, center of the chest. As a soul, I work in light and darkness cannot touch me. 
I take my stand within the light. I work, and from that point, I never move. I feel the radiation, the brilliance of that cross, and that cross protecting the whole group as well. Our preparatory stage has us draw up the light of matter, etheric physical, <coughs> within the personality, draw it up to the mental plane, and then the light of mind joining the light of matter. This is our reasoning, our mental process. The two lights are together. on the plane of mind. And then we meditate on soul contact and we try to recognize our higher nature and the presence of soul light. It is a reality, and the more real it becomes to us, the better. And we draw down that soul light to the lower mental plane, and there join the other two lights. You see that happening with the imagination. And a triple light exists now the light of matter, the light of mind, and the light of the soul, three are as one. three lights as one, and we visualize that. And try to feel the quality of the one light made of three. Each one of us has that, and the group as a whole has that. And we're going to say then, together, followed by the sacred word, the light is one, <clears throat> and in that light shall we see light. This is the light that turns the darkness in today. And what's hinted at there is that the lesser light reveals the greater light, the light of day, Scorpio, the Buddhic plane, Mercury. The first plane of truth. In that light we shall see light. And the sacred word three times oh.
So now we are equipped with the light, which we will expand into a beam, which will be our weapon and our method of revelation and illumination. And so we use the formula while we visualize a great searchlight going forth onto the astral plane, ready to do its job, to detect and banish and dissipate, and disperse the veils, the clouds, the miasmas, the distortions, all that makes the astral plane a plane of distortion regarding the real. And so, together the formula, as we visualize the searchlight, individually and of the group, all individual lights blending into the group beam, Radiance are we and power. We stand forever with our hands stretched out, linking the heavens and the earth, the inner world of meaning and the subtle world of glamour. We reach into the light and bring it down to meet the need. We reach into the silent place and bring from thence the gift of understanding. Thus, with the light we work and turn the darkness into day. So our searchlight is out there in there upon the astral plane. <clears throat> And we're going to strengthen that searchlight, that imagined searchlight, with spiritual will, coming ultimately from the monad through the triad atma and through the synthesis petals and the sacrifice petals and the sacrifice love petal and or love sacrifice petal and knowledge sacrifice petal. Spiritual will enters our beam. Spiritual will enters our beam. Aligned are we as a group with spiritual will. And we say, with power upon its beam, the light is focused on the goal. That goal, the dissipation 
of glamour, especially as we're working now the glamour of the fear of the future, the glamour of fear and the especially fear of the future. <coughs> And so, we will now use the words of power, and as we do so, we visualize our beam, our will and force beam, penetrating this glamour of fear. And in our own way, we see it producing the weakening and dissipation of that glamour. So, the words of power. The power of our united light prevents the appearance of the glamour of fear, especially in this instance, the fear of the future. The power of our united light <clears throat> negates the quality of the glamour of fear, fear of the future, from affecting humanity. The power of our united light destroys the life behind the glamour. In the five minutes that follow, five minutes of silence and intensity of purpose, we will see this work of weakening, dissipation, destruction proceeding, using our will-empowered beam of triple light as one. Five minutes.
in the Yoga Sutras, it says where thoughts contrary to yoga arise, replace the contrary thoughts with thoughts contrary to the contrary thoughts. So this is the place for affirmations of a kind that anticipate a glorious future. Master D.K. tells us of the wonder of the new age. The wonder. And the Christ working in Aquarius and with a great constellation <clears throat> hidden behind Polaris <clears throat> and related to Aquarius, he seeks to bring for humanity the life more abundant in the age of Aquarius. So let us spend time sometimes <clears throat> anticipating through an attunement of our imagination with the pure reason of the buddhic plane and with the divine plan of the atomic plane what may appear and unfold during the age of aquarius which will give us a great incentive to move into the future and not uh, not a fear of what the future may hold. So then we withdraw our beam from the astral plane. It's on the mental plane now and we turn it off Use it again for future work. <clears throat> and we together <clears throat> sound the Om three times. Acknowledging that this work, though particularly focused on the astral plane, helps in the realm of Manas with Kama Manas and the, in the realm of <clears throat> vitality, which is so easily affected by the miasmas and distortions and veils <clears throat> and clouds of the astral plane. Three times the Om. So the sun of the soul shines in three vehicles, <clears throat> bringing a correction in all those three vehicles, <clears throat> dispelling illusion, dissipating glamour, dispersing maya. <clears throat> Okay, friends, thank you. And um, tomorrow uh, night, well, our night anyway, 5 p.m. GMT, Tuya will be uh, presenting on the soul of nations and our intervention, you might say, into world emergencies, of which there are plenty right now, 
we need to be helpfully aware of the worst ones and trying to assist by subjective means. And then on Sunday night, we'll be offering the attracting money for hierarchical purposes, five o'clock GMT. Um, I think we're planning to do a ingress meditation for going into the sign Scorpio, and we'll let you know about that. Remember that no matter what may be the name of our broadcast, now this is a webinar, but no matter what may be the name of our broadcasts, you can always pick up our broadcast by the Ask Comprehensive link. We'll send you, of course, the link that pertains to the program we're broadcasting, but uh, failing that, the Ask Comprehensive link should get you there. So thank you very much for your attendance all over the world and yet at a point of tension. And we'll persist in doing what we can on this level to help clarify <laughs> the situation on a number of planes. All the best to you. Lots of love. Many blessings. Take care. Bye-bye.